Welcome to Babel, Translating the Middle East, a podcast from the Middle East program at CSIS. Here on Babel, we take you beyond the headlines to take a closer look at what's happening in the Middle East and why it matters. As the Israel-Hamas war continues, local peacebuilding organizations are adapting to a changed social and political landscape. To understand how this feels on the ground, I speak with Yana Abu Talib, the Jordanian director of eco Peace Middle East, a trilateral peacebuilding organization that seeks shared solutions to environmental issues affecting Jordan, Israel, and Palestine. Together, we discuss EcoPeace's development over the past 30 years and the unique challenges it faces today. Then I continue the conversation with Natasha Hall and Leah Hickert to explore how grassroots activism and peacebuilding varies in different political contexts. To translate some of what's happening in the Middle East, this is Babel. Yana Abu Talib is the Jordanian director of Eco Peace Middle East, a regional organization that brings together Jordanian, Palestinian, and Israeli environmentalists to promote sustainable development and advance peace efforts in the Middle East. Yana, welcome to Babel. Thank you very much for having me. So what's the connection between the environment and peacemaking? Well, we're considered an environmental peace building organization. But the way we function as an organization is we build trust through focusing on legitimate issues to protect our shared environment between the three countries. That trust is the first necessary step to building peace. So is there something different about peace building in the Arab-Israeli context around environment issues? Or do you think this is something that is generalizable to other conflicts? Well, it it can be, and it it can work in other conflict areas. And this is part of the programming that we do. For many years, we've succeeded in putting together a methodology for environmental peace building that we showcase and we share with other conflict areas in the world. Because the difference between, for us, um, between peace building and peacemaking is two separate issues, basically. Help me understand Um, that. When you involve both the policy and the people on ground, you build peace among people. You have people be part of that long-term peace, basically. Peacemaking is when you see political agreements signed. And that's an important base, definitely. But us as a civil society group, working with people on ground, working as a grassroots organization, we're building long-term peace. We're building that trust that is necessary for peace to be sustainable because the way we do it is that people understand that they're cooperating to achieve water security, to achieve energy security, to achieve climate security, basically. And we showcase how linked they are together. And we highlight the need for cooperation, showcasing the mutual gain and the self-interest of these issues to each of our countries and how we're able to build better communities, and then it becomes sustainable. How many people are involved in eco-peace activities in Israel, Palestine, and Jordan? Well, it depends on the programs. So we have our advocacy lobbying, and they involve high-level issues and coordination and cooperation between the three countries. And it all goes back to our Green Blue Deal for the Middle East that we presented back in 2020. It talks about achieving water security, energy security, and food security, and making that linkage between them all. And why are we saying they're high level? Because it aims at policy change. And there we work on building that political will with decision makers and politicians. But We also have a very wide range of stakeholders in Jordan, in Israel, and Palestine to educate so that they can help put that pressure. Because if people on ground are not convinced, then the projects that are implemented are not sustainable. For example, our climate diplomacy. So every year we work with a new cohort. And we're talking about 150 young professionals from each country that we work with on the national level to train throughout the year to build their capacity, 
for them to understand their water realities, um, what climate security is basically, and prepare them for the regional interactions with their peers in the other offices. So that's one of our components, basically. One of the challenges of a lot of civil society efforts is that the support from outside can overwhelm the amount of support from inside a society. And you have these groups that end up being very focused on soliciting revenue from outside, but don't really develop their own sources of domestic support. As an organization, how do you avoid that problem? How do you ensure that it doesn't just seem like a bunch of foreigners telling Jordanians or Palestinians what to do and to think and to push normalization with Israel. And this feels like a genuine Jordanian-Palestinian effort. So first of all, as a, an organization, we do not take direct financial resources from our governments. So all our funding comes from abroad. This has been since the start of the organization. We do not want to be seen as working for our countries or the governments of our countries. We're independent. But we bring in, like I said, that mutual gain. And we employ citizens of our three countries. So I have a full Jordanian staff that understand the Jordanian law, that understand the Jordanian issues, and are the ones that talk to people and the governments as well. It's not easy to tell you the truth, but we have become very knowledgeable and experienced and trusted in our relationship with different donors around the world. And we even now are able to secure core funding for the organization and not only program funding. But that took us a long time. How do you build trust among Jordanians? I mean, I've spent enough time in Jordan to know there are a lot of Jordanians who are opposed to any notion of normalization with Israel. How large is that group of people who object to what you're doing? And how large is the group of people who at least quietly support what you're doing? So before the war, our life was never easy as an organization, as an Amman office, because we were always condemned of being normalizers. But our power is through our programs, through our methodology. We invest in dialogue, in explaining to people from our different targets group why we're involved in climate security issues, water security, energy security. And we bring information based on research that people don't know. When you talk to someone about regional cooperation or a cooperation with Israel on water issues, you find out that an average Jordanian does not really know the severity of our water situation in Jordan. So when you start passing on that information, it's proved in research that the best options would be cooperation with Israel for purchasing additional quantities of water for so many reasons. And then you come again to the self-interest and the mutual gain for all. Our programs build healthy interdependencies. So we're not only talking that Jordan would continue to purchase one-way water, gas from Israel, but for the first time, Jordan has something to provide to Israel as well. And that's the renewable energy. That healthy interdependency gets people to understand. So that's our power. After the war, things are really complicated. And the majority of people do not believe in peace on the Jordanian side. It's a tough situation. And we're now trying to focus on what matters. So what we're doing is focusing on how in the three offices, we're able to work on creating a trilateral alliance to allow humanitarian aid to both West Bank and Gaza, focusing on the wash sector, water, sanitation, and hygiene. The needs are tremendous at this time. And again, we're working with decision makers, even in Jordan. So I coordinate with the relevant ministries here and then pass on the information to our other offices so that we can move things. And this is something that we have a proven track record of for many years. And hopefully that would lead to more important issues that we need to focus on, especially the day after the war, the rebuilding and reconstruction that is needed. 
Of course, and all the other issues like the water, it cannot stop the conflict issues. People need water to survive. And with the climate crisis, in addition to the humanitarian crisis that we see now, it's going to make things even worse. And that's why we're able to work with the relevant decision makers to continue to move these important issues forward. Most Arab-Israeli peacemaking has evolved to being between Israelis and Palestinians. This is not a bilateral group. It's a trilateral group. How does Jordanian involvement change the dynamic in how Arabs and Israelis engage on environmental issues? Jordan's role is important because 75% of the Jordan population is from a Palestinian origin. And therefore, Jordan's role in maintaining the balance in Palestine is really important. For example, Jordanians talking to Palestinian decision makers to sign trilateral agreements in relation to the Jordan River or the water energy nexus plays a major role to convince the Palestinians, but also plays a major role in convincing the Israelis as well. How has the current violence affected government-to-government -government cooperation on water between Jordan and Israel? The agreements that existed as part of the peace agreement, the water agreement, continues. Coordination is there, and Jordan receives its full share of water according to the agreement. And then the short-term agreements that were signed two years ago, to purchase 50 million cubic meters of water are also moving forward. The worry is the future. So what we're trying to move forward as a group is to have discussions with the Jordanian and the Israeli government to renew the water agreement based on the 50 million cubic meters that was for three years, basically. It's not an easy situation because of the political tensions that we are seeing. But I must say, the Jordanian government and the Israeli government understand the importance of the water issues. And there are certainly some plans to expand agreements that the foreign minister announced in November Jordan was not going to pursue. You mean the water energy nexus? Negotiations on that level have all stopped. But my discussions, at least with the Jordanian government, that this is something that is of strategic importance for Jordan. And we're having the same discussions in our Israeli office, that it's of strategic importance for the Israelis as well. And in the right time, we will help move it forward to a full agreement and then help implement the agreement. Because nothing is as easy as it sounds in our region. So what are your plans going forward? You talked about the green-blue deal. You're dealing with the ongoing violence in, in Gaza. What is your expectation for the next year, the next three years, the next five years? What's the role of EcoPeace as, as peace builders in a conflict where there is going to only be more need to build peace? So long term, our work is to continue to focus on climate crisis. And we have all the different components of our Green Blue Deal, like the water energy nexus, the rehabilitation of the Jordan River Valley, and all that negotiating a water agreement between the Israelis and Palestinians. And then the continuation of our educational programs on climate resilience and the climate crisis. At this time, we're focusing on the humanitarian aid and creating that corridor where all of our three countries would work together on allowing the humanitarian aid to enter through Jordan and the West Bank to Gaza and really focusing on the wash sector like I said, but this time linking the health issues that have arised from the war, both on the Israeli side, Palestinian side, to the climate crisis is an important focus.
So we're really working at the national levels with decision makers and as many of our supporters that we've been working with for a long time, but also internationally, getting the U.S. administration involved to help us push this forward is important. Also the EU. And you've talked about how the environment in Jordan has become less open to the kind of work that you've been doing in the midst of the war. You talk to your Palestinian and Israeli colleagues. What do you hear is happening to the communities that were open to this kind of cooperation in Israel and Palestine? And how are they dealing with the current violence and its effects on their operations? So we're in it together. Thank God we have each other as a group. And since the war started, we have been speaking every day. We have been working together with our teams, definitely focusing on the well-being of our staff and the security of our staff at this time. Is that a problem in all three locations? It's the same. Unfortunately, there's polarization. And we hear that peace is not possible from everyone. Even people that used to really support our work, they would say to me that, no, 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 this can't go on. It's not possible anymore, not after what happened. Of course, things will change, but it's going to require time. Because as the war continues, as the pain continues, you cannot really have a good dialogue with people. But we're facing the same situation in all three countries. We're attacked, but then we're accused of being dreamers. And we see that people are polarized and do not believe in peace anymore. As somebody who's been doing this for decades, what do you see in this cooperation that other people who haven't been doing this work don't see from your work with Israelis and Palestinians on environment issues? I see that it creates mutual benefits for all, on all levels. Because when each country is looking to really fight climate change on its own, first of all, it's not possible because our environment knows no borders and much more expensive and would take a much longer time. It's not possible really moving forward on achieving climate resilience without regional cooperation as an organization, we bring in that regional vision that we all will benefit from and will help us move forward. Yana Abutalib, Jordanian Director of EcoPeace Middle East. Thanks for joining us on Babel. Thank you very much, Dr. Osman. During the interview, Yana discussed the important impact that EcoPeace and organizations like it could have on Jordanian, Israeli, and Palestinian relations. Looking at a different context, what is the importance of grassroots organizations in authoritarian systems? Well, it's interesting because authoritarian systems don't have to respond to electoral pressures. They don't really have the same necessity to respond to the public. But I think there's a way in which grassroots organizations can reassure adversaries that there's somebody to work with on the other side. There's a utility to an authoritarian government to having people who can engage. And in many cases in the Middle East, you have these think tanks, which are full of essentially government officials who go around and say, oh, I'm just a professor. But they go, they collect information from everybody. They speak on behalf of the government, they go back to the government and talk. And it's really not non-governmental, but it gives you a sense for what's going on outside of official diplomats. I think there's a way in which, in some cases, the point of the supposed grassroots is to demonstrate there's some depth behind the government ministers, but sometimes there's not a lot of depth behind the government ministers. I mean, I would say, you know, speaking to what John was originally saying about the lack of elections or the need for authoritarian systems to get popular support, I do think that, in a sense, grassroots organizations could be a release valve in that kind of environment. I don't think that they have been appreciated as such in the Middle East. 
And often, especially the case with environmental activists, they've been exiled and they've been imprisoned over the years. But I do see a slight change. And again, these aren't necessarily authoritarian systems. I'm speaking about Iraq and others that do have elections. But I think they're beginning to see that there is a synergy that could develop there on both sides. I think grassroots organizations and civil society is realizing that. And I think governments are as well. Because governments, even in authoritarian systems, are not a monolith, right? There are those that are might be more reformers. There are those that might care more about certain issues. And so I think civil society is finding its way, but trying to find its way to those reformers, to those people that seek change and trying to reform the way that they do things from sort of like a blame and shame kind of thing to how do we address the political limitations of these particular government officials that are trying to change things. And I think governments as well are beginning to see, although it's a growing process, that civil society could also be used in the same regard. How can grassroots organizations that rely on external donors free themselves from being beholden to either foreign finances or interests? So I think this is a really big problem, not just for grassroots organizations, but aid organizations as well. Oftentimes, rather than serving the public interest, for example, or even national interests, they're serving donor government interests. And this has been, I mean, a problem for as long as grassroots organizations have been around and as long as aid has been around. And I think that that's the issue with sort of an organization like EcoPeace, There are not many Jordanians that support what EcoPeace is trying to do with Israel. And Yana spoke to some of the reason for that, because 75% of Jordan, I've seen different percentages, but the majority of Jordanians are Palestinian, and other Jordanians care deeply about the Palestinian issue. So when an organization comes in and says, we're going to depend on Israel for 20% of our water, And in return, we will give Israel 2% of their energy needs. They get concerned. And that's why you've seen protests about that particular deal. Because for them, they see, you know, Jordan giving energy to an energy-rich country and them becoming heavily dependent as a water-poor country, one of the most water-poor in the world, for water from Israel. And it's a country that they haven't had great relationships with when it comes to water throughout the years. So I think that EcoPeace does care deeply about this issue and this particular deal. But I do think in other cases, it's very difficult to separate oneself from donor interests and actually really focus on the interests of your communities. There's also a practical issue that in a country like Jordan, a country like Egypt, there aren't that many organizations that can meet the international donor requirements basically on accounting terms for somebody getting American grants, the drug-free workplace requirements, all the attestations about rights and sexual harassment and employee rights and all those different kinds of things. There are legal requirements to take money from a lot of foreign donors, and there aren't that many institutions with the knowledge, with the infrastructure to do that. And so what you end up doing is you end up having a small group of specialized organizations, and often they specialize in attracting foreign donors. They can withstand an audit effectively. And the attention goes not to how do I build domestic support, but the attention goes to how do I work in foreign languages with foreign donors, with foreign financial structures, and you build a business model that ends up being external to the country you're trying to affect. I did a piece before the Arab Spring, maybe 2006, called The False Promise of Arab Liberals in Policy Review, which said that there's a problem. It's like if all you're growing a plant and all the water and all the light comes from one side, the plant grows at an angle. And I think one of the real challenges for everybody trying to create change in the Middle East and other places. As a foreign donor, you want to see the change and you want to nurture and support it, but you want to make sure that you're developing enough on the ground that it's really thriving in its environment and relying on its environment and not just relying on the foreign donor. 
Is that foreign influence, whether intentional or unintentional, something that makes peace building a difficult issue for people to rally around? And what other issues make peace building a difficult issue for people to rally around? I think peace building is really hard when the peace never comes and people are often left twiddling their thumbs, wondering what to do. We had an excellent guest, Khalil Sayyid, a few months ago, who spoke to this issue, specifically within the Israeli-Palestinian context, that he started off in peace-building organizations, sort of grassroots organizations. And at first, they could sort of handle the imbalance of power between the Israeli members and the Palestinian members. But as time went on, and there was no addressing of Palestinian rights or the peace process altogether, it broke down. And, you know, and he spoke about how a lot of those organizations have broken down. So I think it's an enormously difficult issue, not just because of foreign funding, but because peace is so hard. Conflicts are lasting longer than ever before. There's often really, really deep-seated grievances on both sides. And so even those that want to promote peace, I mean, it's really sort of a Sisyphean struggle. And the nature of peace building is you don't get everything you want. And oftentimes you have to change definitions of what you need. That's a hard process. It's an uncertain process. And oftentimes, as we've seen throughout the Middle East, it can go forwards and backwards. As it goes backwards, the number of people who oppose the peace can increase. And then the challenge is how do you sustain enough incremental progress that people begin to reduce their sense of needs? That's hard. And that takes ultimately some leadership and As we've seen in the Middle East, leadership can be hard to find. I'm sure we can all agree that will be even more difficult in the coming months and weeks. Thank you for joining me, John and Natasha. Thanks, Leah. Thanks. Thanks for listening to Babbel. If you enjoyed this episode, please subscribe to the podcast on iTunes or Spotify or wherever you listen to podcasts. You can find more analysis on this topic linked in the show notes on the CSS website, and you can find us on Twitter at CSIS Mideast. Thank you.